pleasure and honor to be invited to present to this distinguished, it is a very distinguished lecture series. And I'm really happy to have this chance to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in our lab, looking at brain development and neuroplasticity more generally. This is quite a mouthful of a title because, well, yeah, we look at the effects of experience on brain development, but also we're starting to look at the role of variability in genes and how different genes interact with different environments. So that's, I thought that, um, because I know some of you are neuroscientists and some of you are not scientists, and I, I just thought I'd remind you of a few facts about the human brain, which even some neuroscientists don't know, and then talk a little bit about the effects of experience on brain development. Um, within what we've been looking at, the change, changeability or plasticity within vision, hearing, language, and attention. I'm going to go quickly over those first three domains because I want to talk quite a bit about attention, and I know a lot of you are interested in attention, too. <clears throat> and a point I will underscore is that neuroplasticity is a double-edged sword. The same systems that can be enhanced, for example, when a person is born blind, the auditory system, the same systems that are enhanced, say, in deaf people and blind people, those are the very same systems that are vulnerable in development. And so just basic studies of neuroplasticity can really help us target and hone in on uh, processes that may be vulnerable and may be enhanceable, because we know they're both enhanceable and vulnerable. We see a lot of <clears throat> individual differences in our studies, just like everybody here who's a researcher or anybody in dealing with individuals. And we're trying, you know, environments are different and genes are different, so the way that we're sorting out the relative contributions of genes and environments is to train, do an experiment. Oh, well, let's try this, see if we can change that. You, I know th that you know that the human brain is important for everything, that you know everything you do, every action you make, blah, blah, blah. I know you know that. You may not know that this little small organ uh, two to three pounds is the consistency of <clears throat> room temperature butter. Poke a finger. That's how soft it is. It's very fragile. And it is housed in a very hard bone, the skull. But it's worse than that. The skull is jagged. So, you know, if you take, if you head a ball or shake a child, or this little jello brain is going, <coughs> you know, getting ripped and pounded. So just wanted to remind you about that. You know, there's hundreds of billions of neurons and trillion, hundreds of trillions of connections. It is complicated. And what we've learned over the past couple of decades only, people used to think the brain was sort of, well, you know, genetically predetermined and formed at or before birth, like a liver. It's a biological organ. It's genetic. But nothing could be further from the truth, as I'll show you. It's a very long developmental time course. And um, many, many systems are markedly dependent on and altered by experience. Boing, boing, boing. That's what happens. Very bad design, jagged skull. Put jello in a sc human skull. That's how it looks like. Ooh, oh. Pointer here. These are the frontal lobes there. They're the ones who are, they're the ones that are really vulnerable. So we know, we've learned over the past several decades that the adult human brain is a highly differentiated and system that is composed of many different highly specialized brain systems. The eyes would be up here. This is the back of the brain. This is the side. So we know that about the back third of our brain and the back brain of every mammal that's ever been looked at processes information that comes in through the eyes. It's visual brain. And people thought, because this was so ubiquitous and universal and seen in every mammal, that it must be genetically determined. That's, you know, that's what we believed. Well, it turns out this brain area at the back of the brain in all the humans and all the mammals actually gets input from the eyes. So it could be genetically determined to be visual, but it could be that the input, the visual input itself, 
is important in telling that piece of cortex what to be. And we know that that's actually true because in people who are born blind, who don't get any visual input, this part of the brain becomes an exquisite auditory processor and a tactile processor. So input is important and we want to know where does all this organization come from? Is the back part of the baby brain visual? Or, you know, just exactly how determined is all these, this highly differentiated organization? You probably heard of this fact that the number of synapses or connections in the brain rapidly rises and then it gets pruned back to about 50% of the maximal values. Did you know that? Yeah. Well, we know from animal models of this overproduction and pruning that this is a major mechanism whereby experience can shape developing brains by determining which of these redundant connections are going to be kept and which are going to be lost. What's important is, of course, that this process itself takes till at least 25 or 30 years after birth before it's complete or adult-like. And every aspect of the human brain doesn't look, nuts and bolts, hardware, uh, doesn't look mature until a, at least 25 or 30 years after birth. And you probably heard about that too. But this, um, this overproduction and pruning of synapses goes on at different times in different brain areas. Hottenlocker has looked at this in eight different brain areas by counting synapses and brains that came to autopsy. And every curve is different. So this implies then that different brain systems with different developmental time courses would be impacted by input from the environment or experience at different times. And that's exactly what we found. So the way we started looking at this was kind of two developmental approaches. One is sort of looking backwards by comparing adults with normal hearing, vision, uh, speaking adults, with adults who had very different sensory experience, deaf people, born deaf, blind people, or different language experience, people who learned a sign language instead of a spoken language. That's one way to look at the impact. And um, in a way, it's an easier approach than looking at the little children themselves and imaging their brains as they go through different ages and stages of development. But we're, t we're doing a lot of that work now. And So I'll be talking about a lot of different populations, like deaf people, blind people, language impaired people, typically developing children, and so forth. And you might think, well, how is all this integrated? Well, it is under this framework. By studying these different populations, we've observed that different brain systems and subsystems and the functions that they mediate display very different degrees of neuroplasticity and time periods of neuroplasticity. So, you know, there isn't one critical period by any means. There isn't even one within vision or language or attention. Markedly different degrees. And we have, I'm going to show you evidence, too, that neuroplasticity confers the possibility for a system both to be enhanced or to be vulnerable to deficit. If input isn't, if the right input isn't present, the same modifiable systems will show deficit. And so over the past six or seven years, we've been testing the idea that early environmental enrichment in the form of interventions can protect and enhance the plastic and thus potentially vulnerable neurocognitive systems in kids who have or who are just at risk for developmental deficits. We use two different techniques, the event-related brain potential technique that you've probably heard of where we time-locked sampling of the brain's electrical activity to the presentation of different information that our participants are asked to process. So maybe we we'll want to look at brain processing associated with the same physical stimulus when the person's attention is on it versus when its attention is on some other target. And this has a very exquisite temporal resolution on the order of milliseconds. It doesn't have great spatial resolution. It's nicely complemented by the MRI technique where we look at structure, function, as well as connectivity. That's just showing you how we get our little brain waves, and I'm just showing off our little castle. We say, do you want to go in the castle? That's our little MRI machine. Um, so 
We have studied the effects of experience on vision, hearing, language, and attention. I'm going to spend a lot of time on attention. But within each of those domains, within vision, and within language, and within attention, and within hearing, some subsystems, hey, they're pretty constrained. They don't actually change that much, even when experience is very different, even in a person who's born blind or deaf. But other systems are strongly modified by experience and dependent on experience, but only during particular time periods. And there are many different time periods. I'll show you evidence for all this. And then a third profile that we celebrate are those systems that retain plasticity or the capacity for, to be modified throughout life. So as, as I mentioned, we've looked for a long time at people who were born genetically deaf, congenitally deaf, profoundly deaf, complete auditory deprivation. They also learned American Sign Language as a first language, the way we separate out the role of auditory experience and the role of learning a different kind of language on the brain is to study their hearing siblings who are also got normal hearing but learned ASL as a first language. So we know what the impact of auditory deprivation is on the developing brain. And we, this is sideways view again, the eyes down here. As you may know, there are two major visual pathways, both projecting from this visual brain area. One is projecting kind of low down. It's called the ventral pathway for that reason. And it's specialized in processing central vision, <coughs> color perception, form perception, face perception. All those aspects of visual processing are identical in deaf and hearing people. That pathway isn't changed much even in profound auditory deprivation. By contrast, this so-called dorsal pathway, because it projects up here dorsally to the parietal lobe, is important for the perception of peripheral vision, motion perception, and for the ability to sustain endogenous attention, focus on one thing and ignore other things. And this is across modalities. So every single experiment that we did assessing these aspects of vision were markedly enhanced in the deaf. And as I'll show you, most developmental deficits have deficits in these functions on that pathway. But um, the, what we're really interested in now is most MRI experiments just look at the center of the visual field. We can now assess processing all the way out to the far periphery because we developed an acrylic cup fits over the eye in the MRI. And it turns out that's where, I mean, huge. Well, we have areas of the brain that represent the far periphery. We didn't know that before. And those um, areas are markedly enhanced in the deaf. Deaf subjects recruit auditory cortex, but also MT and all those areas to process the way periphery. And um, how could, you might think, how could visual input get to auditory areas in a deaf person? And we have animal models, and we have some ideas about mechanism. There's actually changes in subcortical to cortical connectivity that occur in the absence of competition from a normally present modality. So we do know quite a bit about these mechanisms. We're also looking at multisensory integration because, as many of you know, this is very vulnerable in development. And by implication, we expect that it is going to show marked enhancements in the deaf. But now I want to show you evidence for the two sides of plasticity in, in the same experiment. So um, I've told you, and many other people now have reported enhancements. This is enhancements. This is normal processing. These are deficits. Motion detection is enhanced in the deaf, far peripheral processing, da 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 da. But in the center of the visual field, it's just completely normal. No difference. Now, if you look at many developmental deficits, including autism, Williams syndrome, fragile X, and dyslexia, um, well, central vision and all those kind of ventral pathway functions are normal, too. But if you assess those dorsal pathway functions, they show deficits. So that was in the literature when we did this experiment I'm going to tell you about now. But those were, um, that's just the literature. But we wanted to do, look at this within the same experimental paradigm, because a lot of people use different paradigms and blah, blah, blah. So we put people's heads in a big dome. We had 
congenitally deaf adults and their controls, and adult dyslexics and their controls. And <clears throat> detecting a light in the center of the visual field, uh, there are no differences between deaf and their controls or between dyslexics and their controls, just what I implied with the literature I showed you about. But if you see how long it takes for deaf people um, to detect a light moving in from the periphery, deaf people are significantly faster than their control group and deaf, dyslexic people are significantly slower. So this is, I think, one of the first times we've seen the two sides of plasticity in the same experiment. We've done a lot of work in auditory processing. I'll just tell you that things that are enhanced in the blind, like sound localization and rapid auditory processing, those are deficient in language impairment, for example, and reading impairment. We've done a lot of work in language processing uh, over the years, and I'm not going to talk about this very much, but the way we look at experience effects is to look at bilingual individuals who learn their language at different ages, people who've learned sign versus spoken language, and looked at children of the same age but who have very different language abilities. And in general, what we find is that syntax is very vulnerable if you don't get early exposure to it. So is phonology. But the acquisition of meaning in language, the acquisition of lexicon, goes on throughout life with impunity. So it's one of those lifelong systems. This is true for both oral, oral languages and sign languages. Sign languages have a very different form. Their grammar is mediated through the use of space and motion. And it shows exactly the same developmental and plasticity profiles of that observed in oral oral languages. But that's pretty interesting. So basically, speech segmentation, syntax are vulnerable. They need input at a certain time. Um, but semantic processing or lexical processing doesn't. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about attention. William James, way over 100 years ago, said, well, everybody knows what attention is. And maybe in those days, they did know what attention was. But these days, people use the word in many, many different ways. Some people think it's a new age concept. Or something. So, so when I use the word attention, I am using it in the same way Williams James used it, which is to mean ability. It's the ability to focus on one out of several possible streams of auditory information, say one conversation at a cocktail party, one thought out of several thoughts that might be floating in your brain one visual object as opposed to all the faces in the room. You focus on one thing to boost its processing. We call this signal enhancement. It's enhancing the signal. It also implies simultaneously withdrawal from the other stuff. So it implies withdrawal from and suppression of distracting inputs. That's called distractor suppression. And we can measure each of those mechanisms of attention in microvolts by using a technique originally developed by Steve Hilliard using the ERP technique. So what we're going to do is, if you were, this is for adults, put them, make them fixate here. They're going to keep their eyes here all the time, never going to move their eyes. We're going to look at the brain's response to a light over here in the right to the right of fixation. And we're going to look at the brain's response to that light when we told them, pay attention over here and count the number of slightly dimmer targets. Or pay attention over here and count the number of slightly dimmer targets. So the physical stimulus that we're going to be looking at the brain's response to is identical. The task they're doing is identical. Arousal is the same. The only thing that shifted is their covert you know, secret attention. You can do that, right? You can look over at your neighbor with your periphery of your vision and notice what they're wearing. <coughs> it's the basis of the no-look pass in basketball, right? <laughs> so now we're going to be recording event-related brain potentials. Um, let's look at, this is a normal hearing people first, adults, to event-related brain potentials to this light when they're attending over there, away from it. Well, you get a pretty, you get a recognizable brain response, you know, and it starts at 100 milliseconds. That's a tenth of a second. Now, 
okay, well now we just say, okay, now move your attention over here and count the targets over there. Oh, yeah, okay. So attention is a force multiplier, right? It leverages neural processing by a tenth of a second after the onset of a stimulus. This is very powerful uh, domain general. It operates across all modalities and it's a force multiplier. It's a gain control mechanism. Now, we did the same experiment in people who were born deaf. When they're attending over here, they have the same similar looking kind of small response. But when we ask them to attend over there to the stimulus, to that visual part of the field, oh, the effects of attention in them were twice as big as the effects of attention in our normal hearing subjects. Visual attention is two to three times larger in people born deaf. You can quantify it like in us. Attention amplifies the brain's response by close to 100%. In the deaf, it's closer to 200%. <clears throat> We've also shown that auditory attention is markedly enhanced in people who are born blind. <coughs> <clears throat> We've also shown that in people who became blind after the age of 15, it's not. So there is a window of time when this early fast attention mechanism is plastic, shows a lot of neuroplasticity. It can be enhanced. But what does that also, what hypothesis does that also raise? If it's enhanceable in the deaf and the blind, and it's a double-edged sword, it suggests that it might be deficient in many developmental disorders. And so this kind of work really informs our study of development and training. So we had to, it's, you know, little kids are not that good at fixating in one place and ignoring flashing lights that are all around. So we developed a new paradigm to study this same process in little children. <clears throat> and what we do is, children are sit, sit it here in a nice chair, and uh, there's two speakers in front of them, and we play them two children's stories at once. Even adults are for, taken aback, but we say, ah, uh, that's okay, you can do it. I just want you to pay attention to the blue kangaroo and ignore Harry the dog. And then uh, we superimpose probes on top of this story, and we're going to be recording the brain's response to those, pros, th those probes over here on the right when they're attending hairy versus when they're attending blue. So same physical <coughs> stimulus, same job. They have to ask, answer questions about the content of the stories. <clears throat> the only thing that's changing is their direction of attention. <clears throat> well, would little children have this force multiplier? first experiment, we had to show that adults look like, gave a Hilliard type attention effect, and they do. They, by 100 milliseconds, their response to those probes is larger than when they're attending away from them. Good. Now, we've got eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds, and six-year-olds, and oh, their brain response to these auditory probes looks very different than the adults because the auditory system takes a long time to look mature, actually. So it's this sustained positivity. But the very interesting and important fact is that by 100 milliseconds, this response is twice as big when attention is on that channel, on that story, versus when they're attending to the other story. By 100 milliseconds, six, seven, and eight-year-old kids have a very adult-like looking uh, early attention effect, a leveraging effect. And um, well, Steve Hilliard was very skeptical about this upside down attention effect, you know. Well, so of course we had to replicate it. And in this experiment, we did the same experiment with adults. They got a negative attention effect, and then the six to eight year old kids got the same old, nice positive attention effect. And we took it down to three, four, and five year old kids. Now, three year old children by 100 milliseconds have this gain control mechanism available to them. Okay, so we can measure attention in you know, little kids. And uh, we, had, we wondered whether this mechanism might be impaired in other 
populations with developmental disorders. For example, we looked at a bunch of specifically language impaired kids who have you know, normal IQs and are matched to their typically developing controls on everything except they have very low language compared to their typical controls. And what we reported was that, oh, whereas the typically developing kids have a very beautiful attention effect, the specifically language impaired kids didn't. Now you could say, well, why don't they have an attention effect? Is it because they're not boosting the attended signal, or is it because they're not suppressing the distracting information? And it's very clear um, their distractor suppression mechanism is equivalent to typically developing kids, but they're not boosting uh, the, the signal when attended. Even though they are doing what we told them to, they answer as many questions correctly about the story as a typically developing kid, so they're doing what we told them to. Now, I told you we published two papers saying young children have an attention effect. But who do you think we were studying in those studies? Who do you think all the cognitive neuroscientists over there at the mind and brain, Steve Lux place over there, who do you think they study mostly? Yeah, college students. And, co and the children of college students and the children of faculty. And that's who we studied in our first two experiments. So, and that's what we got, very beautiful attention effect. But then what we did was just went beyond the university community to a different demographic. I mean, university is pretty high, educate, high higher socioeconomic status. So we went beyond the university to a different demographic. Oh. And so what we reported was that they have a markedly reduced or absent attention effect. And this, and this is very clear. And uh, then you could say, why don't these lower socioeconomic, these typically developing low SES kids, typically developing, neurologically normal, why don't they have an attention effect? Is it because they're not boosting the signal or because they're not suppressing the distractors? Very clear. They're boosting the signal just fine. It's just that they're not suppressing the unattended information to the same degree as the typically developing kids. You could imagine why, I mean, you could only speculate about why in a potentially dangerous environment that you might not want to, I mean, but we could just, we don't know. But anyway, that's the mechanism. That's why they don't have an attention effect in our experiment. Now, it is tempting you know, when you see these higher, lower SES results, it's very tempting uh, to attribute them to the very different environments of higher and lower SES children. Because, you know, they are very different environments. But, you know, that's just a correlation, right? Just because a bad environment correlates with bad cognition doesn't mean it's the cause of it, right? Correlation is not the same as causation. It could be a third variable. It could be a third variable that is making their environments poor or over and over again, and you know, rendering their cognitive skills, language, and everything poor too. What kind of third variable could it be? Well, policymakers always point out it's probably genetic. Okay, so let's look at genes. So we know actually that genes are important in attention. We're learning quite a bit about the genes important in attention, and memory even. And um, so now, with all the little children that we study, we just get them to spit in a vial, and then we get some DNA, and we're, look we're looking at the genes that are important in cognition, the ones that we know are important in cognition. Like, you've probably heard of uh, the neurotransmitters, dopamine, right? That's a very important neurotransmitter in the brain. It's important in attention. You've probably heard of serotonin in the brain. It's a very important neurotransmitter. It's important in regulating stress. And as we shall see, it it's, has pretty profound effects on cognition as well. So those are the kind of genes we're looking at. <clears throat> now, this, these are data from kids before we've done any intervention. This is MAOA, which is important in metabolizing dopamine and serotonin. These are data from three, four, and five-year-old kids on many different measures of language and cognition, quantitative reasoning, working memory, and so forth. 
And I'm just showing you z-scores. So if you take an average of the group and just show our kids mostly uh, below it or above it, oh, what I forgot to tell you was everybody has an MAOA gene, but you get a different form of it. They're called alleles, right? And you get one from your mom and one from your dad. And so it's sort of like in the periodic table, you get different forms of elements. They're called isotopes. Same thing. It's just a variant. Well, for MAOA, you can either get a three repeat. It doesn't matter what it means. And if you did get a three repeat, oh, you're, you're, doing le you're doing, on average, worse than the group average. But if you got a four repeat, you're doing better. And those three repeat guys don't have an attention effect, but the four repeat guys do. This is the dopamine transporter gene. Get different alleles of that, long or short. If you have a long allele, oh, those children don't have any attention effect. But if you get a short allele, you have a very handsome attention effect. Well, who knew that genes would account for so much variability? This, we were actually pretty surprised. Now, finally, serotonin, um, 5-HTT, it's a serotonin transporter gene. And um, I don't know if you know this, but if you have the long, long form of the serotonin gene, you have a lot of serotonin in your brain, and you're protected from stress and depression. So Caspi and others have looked at the impact of highly stressful life events on uh, rates of depression and suicidal ideation, and they've looked at it as a function of what allele of the serotonin transporter you got. Well, these guys, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, they don't get stressed. These guys are the ones that are likely to be stressed and depressed, short, short. I'm just telling you that background information because look, the effects on cognition are the opposite. Okay, they're protected from stress, but they don't have an attention effect. And they have 10 fewer IQ points. These might be the dumb, happy guys. <laughs> Well, there are, there's more than one gene anyway, so. <laughs> uh, so these guys have a nice attention effect and a high IQ and, uh. Now, first thing I wanna tell you is, so far, in the genes we've looked at so far, there are no differences in distribution between higher and lower SES children. Furthermore, we all know that genes are expressed differently and have different consequences in different environments, right? So genes are not destiny. They're expressed very differently in different environments. And how different are human environments? Yeah, they're really different. So this is the way, this is the way socio, sociologists and epidemiologists capture um, higher and lower SES variability. Um, so a person's SES status is determined by their parents' education and occupation. So if your parent, parent excuse me, had a good education and a professional occupation, chances are you'll be very high in language literacy, numeracy. You'll have way better health and longer life than guys whose parents had low education and low uh, occupation. That's captured by this gradient for Great Britain and in the US, it's a very steep gradient, and it's getting steeper. It doesn't have to be like that. Look at Sweden and Cuba. So countries with lots of social programs, they have a pretty flat gradient. And in general, not in, I mean, they way outperform the countries with bigger disparity. I'm going to show you more data on that later. Yeah. Now, if you think about SES in America, well, it's so many different variables. Like, how do you unpack it? Because those different demographics differ in prenatal care, drugs, depression, dollars. The schools are funded by property taxes. Hello. Cortisol is much higher in low SES children, and everything's different. And many studies over the years have reported lower IQs, lower language scores, and we've now seen differences in brain organization between higher and lower SES children, and most of the studies are done on children. 
That's what I already showed you. But Eric Pakulak in our lab has now shown that these differences are maintained all the way into adulthood. So they don't go away. So higher and lower SES individuals look markedly different. This is the response to a grammatical error and higher SES individuals all around the world, which is all that's been studied until Eric's study. Um, they pop off this fast little brain response saying, yo, that was wrong, and it's short-lived and fast. And uh, he went beyond the university community to you know, typically developing individuals, but were lower SES. And their response is very different. For this response is fast, short-lived, and really focal. It's left hemisphere, not right. Highly specialized brains. That's what we think language looks like in everybody. Huh. That's because we only studied the university guys. You go beyond the university, this, they have a very long lasting effect that is completely widespread. It's not specialized. And it's not short lived. So, whoa. That's a note to cognitive neuroscientists to go beyond the university community. So, we said before, genes make a lot of difference, environments make a lot of difference, but the way, how are we going to sort out the correlation is not the same as causation. How can we independently assess the role of environments and genes? And that's when we started doing experiments. We took those SLI kids, for example, trained them 100 minutes a day on a program, a computerized program. Uh, on which they did not advance properly and they were considered failures by the company that made that program. But we had an adult tutor sitting beside them for 100 minutes a day, making sure they were focused on those exercises. So auditory attention, visual attention were focused 100 minutes a day. And at the end, they, uh, well, they got an attention effect. And actually, the one in the typically developing kids increased. So that's just in microvolts, the change in attention. The changes was all on the signal enhancement, which is where the deficit was. But most remarkably is their receptive language scores increased about a standard deviation. So it's easy to, to understand why a deficit in auditory attention could lead to a deficit in le receptive language, where in our speaking rate, typical speaking rate, the difference between ba and pa is 20 milliseconds of voice onset time. So this is uh, kids entering kindergarten. And they're, um, they're identified as being either on track for reading, in which what that means is they know a letter stands for a sound. And they might even know the sound of a letter. And then uh, other typically developing kids come in, but they're at risk for reading deficit because they don't know what letters are. And they don't know the names of any of them or that they make sounds. So we put them in the MRI machine. These are five-year-olds. And it's a functional study as well as structural. But we presented them just with a list of letters and false fonts, things that look like letters. But all they had to do was press a button when anything repeated. So all they had to do was have good form perception. They didn't have to know anything about letters. You know what I mean? And then we put adults in there. And this is what typical, you get the reading network. This is the nose and the back of the brain, the left hemisphere, there's an angular gyrus region right here that's important for reading. And so, right, if you know letters, it, you automatically you know, convert these squiggles to sounds. And because this is the activation that's greater for letters than squiggles. So adults are automatically kicking in that process. Now, kindergartners who are on track for reading, well, hey, you can see a little bit of that network activated too. It's bilateral. That's often what we see in little kids. Things start out less specialized, and then they get more focalized with expertise. So that's the beginning of kindergarten. And then uh, they just went through their regular kindergarten curriculum, and we tested them after it. And oh, it's cool. So it, it looks you know, quite adult-like after that, their entry into reading and the first semester of kindergarten. We showed this to their teachers and they screamed. Because that's regular kindergarten curriculum, whoa. The kids who were at risk, uh, they did not have any activations at all that were different between the squiggles and the letters. Because 
they just didn't differentiate them. And they went through an early reading intervention to which we added an attention component, and then we tested them the same amount three months later. And, well, they're differentiating. You can make, just see the hint of an activation over here and here, but there's a lot of activity up here, and that's the anterior cingulate, which is important for attention. So they're working really hard. And by the way, their pre-literacy levels increased up, almost up to normal. So program's working. They're using different brain systems. Da -da -da. Nice, do an experiment. Now I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about the partnership we've had with Head Start over the past seven years. Head Start is a federally funded and state funded preschool program for children living below the poverty line. And uh, we went to our county Head Start, the head, and said, um, could we come in here and randomly assign children to go into different training programs that we want to test? They said, yes. Well, isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's pretty great. That's because I do, we do a lot of outreach in Eugene. We give lots of talks for parents and teachers on brain development and, you know, we just... So they said yes, besides which they didn't have, they could have used the help. There's 18 kids in one classroom and one teacher. So what we were proposing to do was take a group of five kids out for 40 minutes a day and do training with them. And we started, we did lots of different interventions. We tried music because we, there was the idea that music might improve cognition. And, um, and then I figured if music worked, it would work by training attention. Because if you learned an instrument or watch a kid like learn a cello, it's like, focus. They totally focus and suppress distractors. So I hired a teacher, and we all worked together, taking what we know about the architecture of attention and turning it into fun little exercises for kids. Now, these are preschoolers, right? Three, four, and five years of age. Uh, we did, uh, we've done eight interventions. The two that worked in, on their own, so not hybrid, were attention training. We saw boosts from pre to post. This is an eight-week program. And another program that we tried, because of my colleague, Phil Fisher, had developed a parenting program for parents of foster kids. And he said, Helen, when I, they go through that program, their cortisol levels plummet. And he said, it just seems to me like their cognition is improving after the stress goes down. Or he said, well, could you test that? <laughs> I said, yes. Well, the parenting thing was really making powerful changes from pre to post, parenting and attention. So then we made two hybrids with each component in it. And I think I'm going to show that in the next slide. So of course, we had regular Head Start, too, as a control. We've had small group and everything. So these preschoolers that I'm going to tell you about today were randomly assigned to either regular Head Start or one of two hybrids. The ABC, so both involve parents and children. The ABC hybrid is 40 minutes child attention training every school day for eight weeks and three two-hour parent training. The other program, parents and children's making connections around attention. Families come in once a week for eight weeks. Parents go into one room and they get attention training. I mean, sorry, parent training. And then we talk to them about attention and what we're doing with their children in the room next door, training their attention. So heavy emphasis on child over parent, heavy emphasis on parent over child. And we pre and post, we test for language, visual, spatial skills, numeracy, memory, attention, and IQ. Which hybrid did you think would be the most successful? Just raise your hand if you think it would be child daily training. Raise your hand if you think parent, more parent focused. Oh, now you can be evidence based because I'm going to show you the evidence that you were right. <laughs> And of course, we did the brainwave testing before and after and everything. Even William James, all those hundreds of years ago, well, 120, he said, an education that would improve attention would be the education par excellence. Because you need attention if you want to learn the cello, 
arithmetic, soccer, whatever you want to learn, if you can't focus on that and suppress distracting information, you can't do it. Put another way is attention is a force multiplier that operates across all domains. What do we do with the kids? Well, you know, we say, how do you know if somebody's paying attention, the focal points? We they do balance is a good way to practice internal attention. And be noisy, be quiet, regulate emotions and sensory activities. A really good way of training attention is to watch snails. <laughs> I mean, have you pulled in any snails from the garden lately and watched them move around and interact? So seriously, they get their little antennas up and they interact with each other and move really slowly. And kids would do that for hours. We talk about it, you know, and notice things and stuff like that. And then uh, the parent training, we talk about pot using positive language and um, consistent discipline. So I told you not to hit whack. Oh, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> and you know stuff like that. The sort of these are elements of most parent training programs. Choose, give children choices. Not you're going to bed right now. Do you want to go to bed now or in five minutes? And honestly, the parents come back, you know, when they come, you know, we pay families for their participation. So we get these overworked, three-job parents, underpaid, stressed, doing it just for the money. They show up, the first intervention, they're like, right. And then we just say, well, just try one thing, you know, take it or leave it, but just, you might want to try it. And they come back, they're like, my house is completely different. I can control my child. We have extra time on our hands, so it's cool. But the other thing is, we talk to them about attention and how important it is. And actually, I think their executive function is changing. It is, the parents as well. But we talk about that and the importance of attention for their children so that hopefully, and I do believe this is what's happening, is they're taking the activities um, that we share with them and they're taking them home. And they're doing them at home with the kids. A lot of this is using music, by the way. So we use songs to get ready for bed and, you know, just use music as a mnemonic, too, for parents and children. Parents, everybody loves music, so music is powerful. And uh, we use it to train attention in both the parents and the children. And we thought that training parents in these strategies would change their parenting behaviors and their stress levels and the decreased stress would improve cognition, language, and brain organization. Well, first, did the parents change? We videotaped parents and children. This is not well labeled, but this is a videotaped parent-child dyad. And um, what we talked to parents about is instead of them doing a one-way barrage of information toward their child, or a single word, shut up, just say, try, try to this kind of serve and return approach. So. If your child says one thing to you, you might want to say one thing back instead of five or something like that. You know. So it's called turn taking. And we measured that from pre to post. These are gain graphs. So it significantly increased in the parent focused intervention. Didn't change at all in the other in the child focused intervention or in kids going to regular head start. We changed the parents' behavior. <coughs> We changed the parent's stress. It markedly decreased, but it didn't change much in the other inter active intervention or in the head start. What about the children? Child behavior, so challenging challenges to the parents by the children decreased in this, and actually in both interventions, but more so in the parent-focused one, but didn't change at all in the regular head start. Okay, so we're changing parents' and children's behavior. What about cognition? Oh, yeah, now this is receptive language, markedly improves in the PCMC, but no significant, not, not a significant improvement in the child-focused versus Head Start alone. Head Start is good for language, though. These are pretty good gains. It's kind of a tough comparison group, but. And then the nonverbal IQ, Stanford Binet, kids go up, you know, like 10 points. 
where and these kids go up a little but not as much and they they don't change and what about the brain waves well if you look at head start just head start alone at pretest they don't have any attention effect there's no difference between attend and unattend and nor do the pretest kids that are going into the intervention that's going to be successful after the eight week period these kids don't get any attention effect um, and after the, the parent intervention, you get a very significant attention effect. Really whopping. And we haven't got the voltage maps for the other intervention yet. And, well, from pre to post in the regular Head Start, there's no change in signal enhancement or distractor suppression. But in the intervention group, significant enhancements in signal enhancement and significant enhancements, namely repression for distractor suppression. So we're changing both mechanisms of attention. And we target both mechanisms in our activities. Oh, what about those gene environment interactions? Well, those kids that were low at pretest because they had this form of that gene, the blue guys, they're making the most gains from the intervention. Everybody gains, but they're making the most. MAOA kids are getting a little bit more of an attention effect. Those 5-HTT guys who didn't have, those happy dumb guys who didn't have an attention effect and they had 10 fewer IQ points, they're making most of the gains. Everybody makes gains, but they're making the most. And also, they're starting to get a little attention effect. Long-term follow-up, we've looked at these kids a year and a half out and they're holding on to their gains. Yeah, it's cheap. Our intervention is about 800 bucks a student. The return, so economically, it's, you know, you just have to do it. It's a 9.6 to one return for every dollar invested. Yeah. The achievement gap actually increases across the course of the schooling, public schooling increases. Old interventions that were successful, <coughs> abecedarian, it cost 42000 a kid. Perry Preschool, 14000 a kid. And they targeted parents, but it was expensive. They held, these guys hold on to their gains 50 years later. They're still studying these guys. They're all employed. They're not in jail. That's why. It's a great return on the investment. They're, they've got a job, they pay taxes, they're not in jail, whereas the guys in the control group, they're in jail, they're not paying tax. I mean, it's expensive to not take care of your kids. And so our short-term benefits look very similar to the Perry and Abbasidarian short-term benefits, so we hypothesize that our long-term benefits will too. Big meta-analyses show, oh, the most effective programs target low-income kids, spend a lot of time with parents, and target preschool-age children. That's what it is. That's what the, and then, it, that's not why we did our thing our way, but that's what our th thing is. It targets parents. It's working with poor kids at that age range. So that would only raise the cost of Head Start it, by about 10%. Now, Heckman is a Nobel Prize winning economist at Chicago, goes around the country saying, look, this is, what you, this is the rate of return you get for money invested in the market. But if you invest it in early education, this is the rate of return you get. Hey, way above market, right? This is the rate of return that you get for higher education. Uh, where do we spend all our money? Uh, that's in blue. That's where we spend money. It's all reversed. What are we going to do? So this is disparity. United States, these are first world countries. This is the OECD data. So United States has one of the biggest disparities, steepest gradients between SES of any first world country. And it's not a coincidence, but they score amongst the lowest. We spend more money on education than any other first world country. Our achievement on math, science, and literacy 
is amongst the lowest and our gap is the biggest. Hey, what's going on? In a society committed to equal opportunity for all, many may find the prospect of reducing the economic gap rewarding. So for the sake of the economy and the sake of the children, be evidence-based. So I think the hardest job we have going forward is to convince the public and policymakers to be guided by evidence. And then all we have to do is design and implement effective programs. This is my uh, parent and child trainer, actually, and uh, te ERP testers, behavioral testers. He's the gene guy, Ted Bell. Christina's doing multi-sensor integration anyway. It's a great crew. And thank you very much for your attention. Helen, for that, that presentation. Um, we're, it's open for questions. Anybody have any questions for Helen? Yeah. Hey, thanks for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, just uh, because I'm curious, uh, what did you find related to the, the uh, DRD4 gene? Oh, yeah. Uh, the DRD4 gene is also dopamine related, as you know. and. Um, it's very interesting. I just didn't take the time to go over it, but you know, there are different forms of it, and then you probably heard of, there's a seven repeat form. Have you heard of that? And if you get the seven repeat, it's been linked to ADHD it, and novelty seeking and sensation seeking. And, um, it, but we, we're thinking about it in a different way now, sensitivity to the environment. But anyway, those, seven repeats, if they get into our intervention, they make gains, it's great. But what's the most profound data point is if they're put in the regular classroom, they tank, they lose lots of points across that eight week period. So some kids shouldn't be in a regular classroom. Thank you for a very eloquent lecture. Um, I'm interested in whether you've ever looked at um, any neurodevelopmental groups or kids with ADHD, and also whether you've looked at any effects of medication like stimulants. Uh, does it, I would imagine it might enhance that um, attention enhancement ERP measure, but has anybody ever published on that? You mean as a function of this intervention or period? Period. Oh. Oh, no, that's a good question. Um, we, we just developed and published this paradigm. Uh, well, the first publication was 2005. Now, that's still six years. You'd think somebody would have used it, but no, nobody's, nobody's used it. Nobody's really looked at an effect of any medication like a stimulant to enhance attention. On my attention effect? No. That, I mean, you know, the paradigm is available for any of you who want to use it in all the different populations that you're studying. And I mean, I think it's a wonderful paradigm. The kids like it, they can do it. And um, it's so powerful because you can look at these different mechanisms. That is, if you look from pre to post or from a control group to a other group, you know what I mean? Um, have you looked at any of the computer programs to enhance attention like CogMed or any of those other paradigms to enhance attention? Well, there's so many claims out there for effective brain-based interventions. And I have investigated many of them, and I find that virtually all of them have no evidence to support their efficacy. And at some point, I stopped looking. You really have to be tough, you know. If, if somebody comes to you and teachers are approached all the time, Oh, this is a brain-based curriculum. Teachers, you know, they need to demand the evidence. We haven't trained our citizens to demand evidence, right? And we need to teach our citizens to be able to evaluate evidence. You know, is it really good evidence? Show me the beef. So, yeah, we have a lot of work to do.
Or yeah. Can I ask a question? So, socioeconomic level is it's, it's multifactorial. There's lots of elements in that. Do you have any idea? I mean, it could be it could be nutrition. It could be you know parent interaction. It could be all kinds of things. Do you have any sense of you know what factors are more important? What factors are less important about a socioeconomic level? Well, um, yeah, you just chip away at it one at a time. Like we figured that uh, stress, which is significantly higher in low SES families. Um, stress, we targeted stress in our parenting. And we reduced it and we improved everything. So that's a powerful factor. Uh, well, we didn't look at changing the schools for these kids. I mean, some of them are easier to test than others. you know. But I think it's tractable, it's knowable, and it's doable. We just need an army of people working on this. There's only so much, you know, we can do. Like people say, well, would your intervention work for with higher SES kids? I don't know. I don't have time. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I mean, I suspect it, it might be less effective because in general, environmental variables are less uh, it, uh, account for less variability in a higher SES demographic because there's a certain, op, you know, environments are kind of optimal. I mean, you know, a lot of stimulation, low, you know, lower stress, high SES. And so there you see bigger effects of genes than you do in a low SES sample. Much. So do what's left, once the environments are optimized, like in a high SES, uh, then the environment's optimized, well, the, what's going to account for variability more? Genes. That's why... You know, all those early studies that said IQ is 0.7, heritable, heritable, 0.7, they were all done on high SES families. If you go to low SES families, it's zero, <laughs> it's 0.1, because there is actually a lot of variability in low SES families. I mean, some families are, you know, it's a lot of variability. Some families are pretty, fu you know, functional, and a lot of them aren't, but the dysfunctionality of different families is Different, different, different. Oh, it's been an eye opener working with this demographic and getting them in for pre testing to the lab and then begging them to come in for post testing. <laughs> like, what do you mean you can't make it? That's our data point. <laughs> um, it does appear that our outside world is getting increasingly complex. According to a guy who wrote the bell curve, 10% of high school students should go to college. The other 90% are wasting their time. I was wondering what your comment on that is. Uh, huh? I went to college. I went to college. Pro I probably shouldn't have. Um, <laughs> whoops. Well, we're glad you did. Well, see, I'm one of those long, long guys. <laughs> well, there's so many different variables. There's, well, I mean, that's kind of a, that's hard to comment on such a broad, you know, kind of statement. I mean, why did he say 10% should go to college? Like, they, I don't know. Where's, where's the beef? Like, you know? Uh, I guess he was implying that 10% uh, have the high IQ. They're the ones that are shaping the world we live in today, and they should be taught wisdom. But the other 90% maybe should be taught trade schools or... Are they they're just way over their head if they go into an uh, academic college? Well, I don't know what the evidence is for that, but there are lots of different paths that people take when they go to college. But it certainly is the case that um, going to college these days doesn't guarantee anything. See, it used to. So a lot of people were pretty keen on going to college because, well, pretty much you were going to get a job. That's not true anymore. It's a tiny increase in likelihood of having a job, but you're no very likely you won't have to. Yeah. I was wondering if you had any creative ideas for funding sources for that kind of program, because it sounds great, but um, economically, it's kind of tough here in the county. Uh, well, it's a, it's a bit of a sore point. We keep saying, it's only going to raise the cost of Head Start 10%. Surely everybody will get behind this. But I just was handed. In Oregon, 
our new governor, Kitzhaber, I was just let in on this, and um, I'm going to take it on. It's like our last governor had the goal of and pretty much achieved, I think, 100% funding for kids eligible for Head Start. Now, that's good. And um, it kind of slipped back lately, but what Kit Haber is proposing to restructure all the age, the, um, well, take under the same umbrella all the agencies that provide early education and services to young children. It's going to spend a lot of money restructuring it. And the restructuring will cut the funding for each child for Head Start by 30 to 35%. That's what I just heard from the head of Lane County Head Start. And um, I've got this document, and I'm going after this, I'm going to Portland. And I'm, <laughs> I'm one of the, the right-hand men of Kitzhaber is the woman head of the Children's Institute up there. Oh, I shouldn't be saying names, but anyways, I'm going to meet with her and say, what's going on? Well, I already emailed her. She said, oh, no, it won't be cut. Well, I've read the document now. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So anyway, it's a battle. I just, you know what, I'm, we're so optimistic eternally. We just keep thinking, if we show these data, you know, I mean, everybody will just go, oh, yo, that's it. <laughs> no, you have to be like that. They'll Maybe they'll close their eyes. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for information. I'm allowed to volunteer at my wife's school, which is 93% uh, supported lunches and breakfasts. I would suggest when you're sitting here moaning about the funding, I'm a lobbyist. I'm uh, lobbying for developmentally disabled sen seniors and handicapped. What I'm going to do is take this message back to my community, which is Woodland, to reinforce whatever efforts we're doing to use these modifications on as young a children as we can to argue for whatever method, volunteer, maybe what the reality is now, to use that with the parents. And our parents, about 47% uh, don't speak English. But the point is that I'm trying to share is I can take this information back to emphasize and support what does exist. Good. And I'm realistic. When I go to lobby, I talk to my representatives, and they just look at me and said, what would you cut? But even that aside, the financial aspect, we can still carry the message. And another suggestion, there'll come a time, hopefully, when this will turn around, and we can get back to where we were before. But thank you for your time. I should say the sample, well, this experiment uh, is going to end after the spring quarter. The, the funding runs out, and what we were funded to train attention in, mo these are monolingual, English-speaking, right-handed, neurologically normal, typically developing, <laughs> yeah. Because we know brain organization is different in left-handers. Brain organization is different in bilinguals. And you know, we can't have extra, any extra noise in our data. We need a homogeneous group that we either turn on or off hopefully with our intervention, so. Uh, but anyway, that'll be, it'll be done, it'll be published. I mean, once it's published, all this stuff will, our little exercises and stuff, everything will be online. And we've just, we wrote a grant, who knows if we'll get it, but the next step for us in, along these lines is to adapt our intervention for Latinos, families, who make up probably 80% of Head Start in California. And fully 40% in Oregon, and who are the fastest growing demographic of all in this country who are way overrepresented below the poverty line. I mean, who wouldn't fund that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, your topic is uh, genetic and epigenetic genetic effects on neurocognitive development. The word epigenetic is uh, becoming more of a buzzword in some of the studies, and I wonder if you had a maybe a definition, and if you have a spin on the on the use of the word epigenetic. Um, well, it's sort of 
there's an, uh, going to be an epigenome pretty soon. I guess it's like uh, it's talking about <clears throat> its factors. Epi means sitting on top of. So epigenetic means factors that sit on top of a gene and actually determine how, if it's up or down regulated, how much it's expressed. And um, in animal studies, we know one of these mechanisms of epigenetic changes is methylation. So if you add a methyl group to a gene, stress does this. If you add a methyl group to a gene, it'll shut it down. So the feel good, explore, maybe genes are going to be, be shut. And this happens in plants. It's, not a, it's, it's a biological mechanism that helps organisms adapt to their environment. So a plant in a harsh environment will also downregulate some genes, upregulate others, and grow spikes and get protected, you know, just like people do. So I just think about, about it as uh, extra genetic factors that determine the consequences of gene expression. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm a school teacher in, in Stockton, foreclosure capital of the world, one of the worst places to live. I love it. I also have a kid on the spectrum. She's now four. I'm um, the love of my life. She came in really low. Um, she probably won't qualify the next time we go around. Um, but we've done a lot of work just um, going over uh, social stories and scripts and uh, her creativity has gone through the roof. Her language and expressive language is way above average. So she's no longer going to qualify under language and speech. She definitely qualified under the autism spectrum. Um, as I go into the exit process of special education, I just need to make sure it doesn't revert. And so I would just ask, what would you advise parents who uh, have kids like mine or any kids that's had difficulties uh, what would you do to um, reinforce those things that uh, allow them to continue to grow? Um, such as I do the mirror activities and the, she's a mirror, I'm a mirror. Um, I really liked turn taking. I thought that was a cool idea. Um, the snail thing, I never thought of that. That's just, <laughs> I could see her, but she will fixate to no end, which was part of her old needs. And I gotta watch oh, yeah. a, a, and be avoidant yeah, of the sometimes TV attention in long periods sticky. of time. It can be sticky because another mechanism of attention is to move it. And there are some patients actually who have a stuck attention, they can't disengage, and stuff even starts disappearing. They fixate so long that they go blind. I mean, you know, temporarily until they move their eyes. So yeah, that's right. So I think that um, identifying your child's profile, I mean, of course, this kind of focus, you might not want to practice that with your child because your child already has a very good, in fact, an over good ability to focus attention and keep it in one place. So maybe you want to practice exercises that help her learn how to disengage and go to another activity. Yeah, something like that, yeah. But I think what the, the point is, it's not easy for you, but you know, just get help to get a profile of your child's strengths and weaknesses and imagine little activities that could help them grow or look online, you know, and see what other people have ideas what they had and you know, get the evidence for get the evidence. Like what do we know? What's been tried? And then uh, just do a little experiment. But I mean, the most important thing is that these kids have advocates. I mean, it's, anybody needs an advocate traversing the medical system these days. No, seriously. I've done this for many, many people. They can't, they have no idea. People don't, I think scientists and medical people often don't learn how to communicate to non-scientists or non-medical people. It should be a key part of our training. I was just wondering how you identified the at-risk group for reading. Was it just under L low SES, or was it a oh, genetic no. disability? The, these kids were matched on SES. And the, t um, the people in the College of Education have a way of identifying what entering kindergarten. Kids should know that letters stand for sounds. They should know the names of a few letters. They should know the sounds that some 
make. Uh, you know, that's, what, that's how they measure pre-literacy. That's how they did it. We didn't do it, they did it. They said, oh, so. It's quite standard, I guess. Dibbles, might be dibbles. Hi, Ellen, this is fantastic work. Oh, hi. Um, have you looked at perceived stress in the parents in the parent training and whether there are any individuals who would actually report low perceived stress even though they're low SES? And oh. if they do, do they still show these improvements? And that, that's sort of one half of the question. The other half is what's happening in the marriages? What's happening in the relationship between the parents? Um, as you uh, Between who? Parents. Oh. Well, um, no, first of all, no, I haven't looked at individual data points on those questionnaires, but that, you know, that would be good to do. That would be interesting to do. Um, that's a good point, actually. But Alyssa, thing, Apple, Alyssa Apple finds parents, mothers of children with autism yep. and catastrophic illness who have low perceived stress do not have suppressed telomerase. Do not have, okay. Actually, we, we do have that data, and it's gonna be in our paper too, because um, we, well, at least what we know is that the degree of reduction in stress predicts the degree of cognitive improvement in the child. Yes. Okay. It's, it's a knob that turns something. Yeah. Th that's one thing, and then uh, what else did you ask me? The oh. marriage, the relationship. Marriage. Okay, so that's all different, you know, like we invite the caretakers to come. So sometimes we have the mother and the father. That's important. Sometimes it's a single mom and she brings her mom or her sister. Like anyone who's involved with taking care of the child comes. And people are in all different stages of marriage. Uh, marriage dissolution and difficulties, there's one of those stressors in, as you know, in low SES, very, very common in low SES families. And so, but it, one thing is certain, it's been well documented that um, in low SES families, the average number of highly stressful events going on at any one time is three to five. One of them could be a bad marriage. One of them could be drugs or depression or lost your job or you're kicked out of your house. We've known families with all those five so it's variable, but we have all the data if you'd like to take a look at that. Thanks. OK, well, I think we'll uh, bring it to a close. And thank you, Helen, for a very good question. The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.